everyone. Welcome back to Lunch with the Experts, a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host, and I am a filmmaker, mostly documentaries and a writer, and I have been working with CCF for a decade, folks, since 2011 to create video content. Now we're doing two types of video content. We have produced videos, short documentaries, and treatment-based videos, and this live video series that we're doing, but they're both with the same mission in mind, and that is to educate people and spread awareness about neuroendocrine tumors. That is what we are here to do. So many of you I know tune into the show every week, and we welcome you. We're glad to have you. I see that you already know the drill. Let us know where you're signing on from. We've got Michigan, PA, Chicagoland, um, uh, who else? Hendersonville, North Carolina. I'm in North Carolina, and there's always a lot of people from Canada. I love to see that, too. I guess we're kind of in similar time zones, but uh hello from atlanta thanks skip i appreciate that uh i always love to see how far these programs reach so we have the states and canada so far but pretty sure we'll have people all over the world i see uk already tuning in so folks uh before we get started we always want to thank our sponsor tercera therapeutics without them this this program wouldn't be possible and we have this disclaimer that we like to say and that is the that the opinions expressed by the guest presenters as well as the questions asked by you all, the audience at home, haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Lunch with the Experts. And CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of these views, opinions, or information provided in the presentation. So audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or, inf or information expressed by the guest today and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. So that last line is the takeaway. I always like to reiterate it. We're going to give you some good advice and hopefully answer some of your questions, but we don't know your specific case. So please take that advice, take those answers to your question, back to your home team that does know your case and make the best plan, best path for you, uniquely you, moving forward. Okay, good to know. Uh, today, our guest is, I'm very excited to host Dr. Carol Patsak. How are you, Dr. Patsak? I'm doing fine. Good. Welcome, welcome. We're happy to have you. For, for those that may not know you and the work that you do in this community. Tell us where you work, tell us what you do, and, and what is the role that you fill in the neuroendocrine tumor community? So first of all, I would like to thank for the invitation. It's great honor and pleasure to be here today and to, to have the chance, you know, to answer, you know, some questions, you know, from the audience. I'm pretty sure that they will come very quickly after, you know, I uh, say some few words about myself. And uh, so, as you know, I'm working at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, that is located in Maryland in the US. And I'm uh, heading the section on medical neuroendocrinology. So already in the title, you know, that is neuroendocrinology, we are focusing on neuroendocrine tumors, but I have to be honest, yeah, we are focusing mainly on the pheochromocytoma paraganglia. We are doing it 24-7. And for the last, I would say, maybe 22 years or 23 years, you know, we have been working on pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, not only in terms of, you know, the, the diagnosis management, but also some uh, uh, genetics as well as the new therapeutic options. Um, and uh, we have a group here of the people working here at the NIH, uh, focusing on pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. I uh, just wanted to let you know that, for example, from the NIH, uh, uh, many of you who are actually suffering or suffer from pheoparaganglioma know something about, for example, measurement of metanephrines uh, or measurement of uh, metoxytyramine that, you know, for example, those tests and many other tests, you know, uh, like, you know, modified clonidine tests, et cetera, mm -hmm. came from the NIH. So, so I think that we contributed to this field well, and I will be very happy, you know, to talk to audience, you know, about these tumors and to uh, answer some uh, interesting questions. Got it. So folks, just to reiterate, uh, Dr. Patsak specializes in pheochromocytoma and paraganglionoma. So that's where you're going to get the most benefit uh, from today. So I suggest your questions kind of stay in that realm. Now he's agreed to field, you know, field all the questions, but that's really where you're going to get the most value from him. And I just wanted to, to give a special shout out to Dr. Patsak because he will be giving the keynote presentation at Nanette's 2021 Medical Virtual Symposium next month. Is that right, Dr. Patsak? 
Yeah, that's uh, that's right. You yeah, know, there the, the, will be some interesting findings. You know, really cutting edge. You know, with the update in the field of neuroendocrine tumors, especially as I said, focusing on FIO and paragon. Right. And folks at home, the name of that keynote presentation is Pheochromocytoma, a neuroendocrine tumor in the era of precision medicine. So we have the guest, the expert for this topic today. So go ahead and start sending in your questions. Now, listen, I say this every week. We're going to try to get to all of them, but inevitably we get many, many questions. That's a good problem for us all. It keeps the show going and keeps you getting value. But if we don't get to your question, please feel free to reach out to CCF to, to, uh, get you that information if you have a follow-up question to get you that answer that you need and as always tune back in next week we will have more content and all the content i've created for over the past decade with ccf is available you can go to their youtube channel or you can go to the videos tab right here i promise you if there's a topic that's important to this community we've probably covered it we do it ccf really does their best to stay on top of everything the cutting edge in terms of the news so go ahead and start sending in your questions and we're going to start taking those couple of things. If you know someone who would benefit from this, who has pheochromocytoma questions, paraganglionoma questions, tag them in the comments. Go ahead and get them here. Let's try to get as many people here as possible for this interactive session. And the last question that I have, I ask every week from you all, and you do a great job of this. If you see a question in the sidebar in the comment section that you also have, because we get so many, if you see a question that you also have, or you're interested in the answer to, you can look right below the comment and there's a little like button or like option. Click that. It'll let me know that there's a demand for that question. If I see eight people have liked that same question, it shows me that I really need to get that one across. It just helps me do my job, which is to serve you. So thank you for that. Um, okay. So Dr. Patsak, let's do this. Um, you know, I talked to you before about how educated our community is here. I'm sure you're already aware of that, but every week we have new people to the show. So can we start with just a basic knowledge, pretend I know nothing and explain to me, and I've heard of neuroendocrine tumors, right? And neuroendocrine cancer. What, what does pheochromocytoma mean, paraganglionoma? What, what exactly is that? Let's lay that first bit of foundation. So this, uh, in simple term, you know, as, as you mentioned before, the, those are neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, those neuroendocrine tumors, pheochromocytoma, is actually arising from cells that we call chromaffin cells. And most of these chromaffin cells are located in the adrenal gland. Okay. So these tumors are arising uh, approximately about 70, 75% of patients from adrenal gland, whether it's on the right or left or both, and we call them pheochromocytoma. Now, those that are outside the adrenal gland, because the chromaffin cells and the ganglia actually are not only like, you know, representing the adrenal gland, actually the adrenal medulla in the adrenal gland, but also outside, you know, those uh, and located everywhere in the body, really everywhere in the body, except for two organs, bones and lymph nodes. Otherwise, you can get all, you know, the chromaffin cells practically in all organs. So those are called paragangliomas. And mm -hmm. uh, paragangglioma represent approximately 20, 25% of these tumors. And then we have a special a group of uh, mm, uh, uh, cells that are located in the head and neck, and they can actually uh, mm, uh, mm, be, change, you know, for, you know, the, have, you know, the, uh, in the tumors that we call head and neck paragangliomas. And that is approximately 5% of all these tumors. And they are actually arising from parasympathetic nervous system. So we have actually three categories, head and neck paragangliomas. Out, those two are outside the adrenal gland that we call paragangliomas, especially in the abdomen, thorax, for example, in the pelvic area. And the last one, the, the, the most common are pheochromocytoma from the adrenal gland. And finally, I would like to say that these tumors are very interesting because they are producing catecholamines and the catecholamines like norepinephrine and epinephrine. Mm -hmm. And those catecholamines, what is important in the diagnosis, if somebody will ask later on about the biochemical diagnosis, these catecholamines are actually metabolized inside of these tumors and they are metabolized to uh, metanephrines. And metanephrines are the most important 
in the biochemical diagnosis of these tumors. Not catecholamines, because not always the catecholamines are secreted from these tumors, so in approximately only in 70% of patients, but the metanephrines are actually secreted practically in all, you know, from all the tumors, and therefore the biochemical diagnosis is based on the metanephrines. Awesome. That is, uh, that is some thorough groundwork. I appreciate that. So hopefully that helped everybody. Uh, before we continue on, I want to say a shout out to Ruby, Ruby, who says today is my birthday and I can't think of a better gift than this program. Thank you, Rain and Dr. Potsock. Ruby, happy birthday. And uh, I am honored that you would share it with us here. That tells me a lot about uh, the work that we're doing. So I'm very, very grateful and very happy and uh, happy birthday. Uh, folks, if you joined us later, you just joined us. This is Lunch with the Experts, the Carson and Cancer Foundation program. And today our guest is Dr. Carol Patsak, and we're talking primarily about pheochromocytoma and paraganglionoma. Um, so first question that we have from the audience, um, Dr. Patsak, is how common is it for a net tumor um, to have a net tumor and a pheopara? Oh, that's a very interesting, challenging question, I have to say. Yes, it's, uh, we, we can see it that we have some patients with pheo uh, paraganglioma and neuroendocrine tumor. It's, it's, a, it's uncommon, it's rare, okay. okay? So if I would take maybe about 100 patients with pheo paraganglioma, I would say that I would have, mm, you know, maybe about two, maximum three, or maybe two patients. So it's about 2% or so that you will find the patient with the pheoparaganglioma as well as neuroendocrine tumor. Is the neuroendocrine tumor can be located in you know, the different uh, part of the body. Very often they are located in the pancreas. If you, for example, find the neuroendocrine tumor in the pancreas and for example, pheochromocytoma, you are thinking about uh, syndrome, which is called VHL, von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. But there are also some other mutations like succinate dehydrogenase uh, um, mutation that they are actually uh, together or link, you know, together with uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And, uh, uh, but those cases are extremely rare. There is one actually syndrome that is related to so-called somatic mutation if hypoxia inducible factor, we call it HIF. And those patients may have also neuroendocrine tumors and usually in the pancreas, but the most common, and this is very interesting, uh, it's uh, they have uh, actually uh, the tumor in the, um, in the duodenum and in the certain part of the duodenum, and which is called somatostatinoma. As you know, somatostatinoma is neuroendocrine tumor. And approximately 30% of these patients, they have this, uh, this uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumor. So it really depends. And there is a very small group of patients that we do not have right now uh, any genetic, uh, I would say, uh, problem or genetic uh, disorder, or you know, we did not find any gene that would cause that, but I'm very much convinced that having two rare tumors, like if you have something which is rare, that is neuroendocrine tumor itself, like you know, in the pancreas, a neuroendocrine tumor uh, represented by pheoparaganglioma, I'm pretty sure that there is the genetic defect, but we don't know about uh, 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 those genetic defects in small group of uh, patients at the present time. Got it. And and what, I know you said there's only what, two or three mm. out of a hundred? Oh yes, that would be maximum. Yeah, so what- you unless, need... unless you don't deal with, you know, VHL, you know, von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, you know, okay. the, 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 of course the percentage would be higher, but you know, from all the patients with pheoparaganglioma, the VHL, you know, represent only certain percentage of those tumors. What unique challenges does it present when you have someone who does, you know, one of those couple of people out of 100 who does have a net as well as a para uh, FIO? Yeah, so the challenge is what you will do first, you know, will you operate on those patients? Mm -hmm. And most likely you will, but will you operate on neuroendocrine tumor like in the pancreas or for example, in the duodenum? Or you will, uh, or you will, for example, operate on the pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma first. You know, for our audience, remember, pheo slash paraganglioma always comes the first. 
Okay. Always comes the first, okay? And the reason is that most of them are secretory. So they actually produce and secrete, as I said, uh, catecholamines slash metanephrines. And if you would operate, for example, on something else like, you know, neuroendocrine tumor in the pancreas, patients can go to hypertensive crisis because the tumor, the pheochromocytoma or paraganglium is present there. So when you operate on the tumor, uh, I mean, on the neuroendocrine tumor in the pancreas, the pheochromocytoma will be very active or paraganglioma will be active. I do, will not go into the details why these tumors are becoming active, especially during operation, but I can tell you they will. And in most patients will be very active and you have to counteract uh, the effect of catecholamines, which means you, know, you counteract hypertension and severe tachycardi tachyarrhythmia. Got it. Thank you. And, and thanks for your question, Effie. Hopefully that helped. It, I would maybe I would maybe say one thing, you know, Please. for the, our audience, there is one exception when you will not operate on pheoparaganglioma first. There's, there is always exception. Remember, there is always sure. exception in everything. Mm -hmm. And you will not do it if you have an acute situation. For example, the patient is coming with perforated, for example, appendix. Okay. okay patient is coming, you know, with chest pain and there is myocardial infarction and, you know, cardiologists and uh, specialists, they need, you know, to put the stand or, you know, the stroke that they have to put, you know, they have to do operation, for example, brain operation. So in that situation, you will never address pheochromocytoma paraganglioma first. You will address, you know, acute situation. You have to tell anesthesiologists what is going on. They will, they will have difficult job because they will have to actually deal with that pheochromocytoma paraganglioma that is not being removed because something else is being fixed as a very acute. But this is only exception that you, the pheoparaganglioma comes as the second one. Got it. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, now we had talked, we had mentioned surgery on the last, the last answer or when mm. we were talking about the nets. And so Anne Marie has a question and that is, is there a minimum size for paraganglionoma before surgery is considered or is it based on location? Yeah, I like that question. Actually, this is very interesting question. So minimal size, you know, the minimal size is comes, uh, you know, usually minimal size is approximately seven millimeters. Okay. So I would say that is less than one third of an inch. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is the minimal size that, you know, the surgeons can actually remove. And the reason is, you know, uh, uh, imagine that they go into the body, they open everything. There is blood, is everything is bloody. You know, they have to locate the pheo or locate small paraganglioma with usually ultrasound. And you can imagine there are a lot of other structures, uh, adipose tissue, uh, fibrous tissue, and you have to go, you know, to some very small, almost like, you know, uh, that, you know, that you see the, all the ultrasound. So usually 0 0.7 millimeter, I say 0 0.7 centimeter, which means seven millimeters is maybe the cutoff. I usually don't like to go lower unless the patient has really very severe hypertension, very severe tachycardia, and you cannot really um, uh, block it well with uh, uh, adrenal scepter blockade and we had those patients but very rarely so but usually this is this is the cutoff whether it's uh, different from pheochromocytoma paraganglioma absolutely because the uh, the adrenal gland is very very well delineated you can see the adrenal gland well you can image the adrenal gland well even with the ultrasound you have a pretty good access to adrenal gland if you have paraganglioma you can image that is you know somewhere in the abdomen you know, okay. somewhere around the big vessels, you know, can be even in the chest or pelvic area. So it's sometimes very difficult. So I would prefer paraganglioma to be approximately one centimeter and larger before it can be removed. Of course, it depends on the situation, how the patient is doing, but I would say around one centimeter, that is good success because you have to be aware of one situation that surgeons can miss. So the patient will wake up and you will tell the patient oh, you still have a hypertension, you still have a tachycardia, your catecholamines or metanephrines are positive, you will need a second operation. And I can, I, I will be honest with you, it happened to us. 
happened to us twice in the 20 years that, okay. you know, even, you know, the tumor was approximately one centimeter when I would expect that everything will go well, you still can miss. So, so remember smaller, you know, it's of course uh, more difficult to remove it. However, if you have successful operation, the outcome, if the tumor is smaller is much better because the chance to develop metastatic disease is practically zero. Got it, got it, got it. Well, thanks, Anne Maria. Ho hopefully that uh, that helped answer some of your question. Now, next question, uh, Dr. Patsak from Kate says, uh, "How does SDHB pheo uh, para affect pregnancy?" And let's before I, I, I'll keep asking the question, but I do want to establish what what that is SDHB because a few people have been mentioning that. Um, I recently had a miscarriage in my first trimester. Plasma catecholamines were slightly elevated. Waiting on 24-hour urine now while dealing with the miscarriage. Is there any correlation between the two? Oh, it depends. You know, the first, you know, you wanted to know something about SDHB or miscarriage. Let's let's address what SDHB is because yeah. uh, I see a few yeah. people mentioning that. Yeah. SDHB is succinate dehydrogenase subunit B. There are four subunits, A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. And for our audience, and also when I talk with fellows, uh, and when I educate, you know, some healthcare professionals, I always tell them B as a bat, okay? Okay. So, so it's something that if you have SDHB, it's the worst scenario that you can have. Uh, among all the subunits, as I said, A, B, C, D. So it's number one. So it's, uh, it's associated or it's uh, uh, closely linked to more aggressive disease, metastatic behavior and multiplicity, okay? So, so when we have a, somebody with SDHB, we have to be very, very careful that those patients needs, you know, not only very good imaging, and we can talk about it later on, which kind of imaging, because there are some specifics for imaging for SDHB, but also they need to have very good follow-up. And on the top of that, they need to have some specific operation. I will give you one example. And this is especially for those patients who are today, you know, around uh, and listening to this um, seminar about, you know, the, SDHB and for example, if the tumor is sitting in the adrenal gland, so it's pheochromocytoma, the patient has a SDHB pheochromocytoma, we know based on the genetics and the tumor will be two centimeter. And if you have a, another pheochromocytoma, which is for example, sporadic or to, related to different mutation, the doctor will always offer to you, I will do the partial adrenalectomy, okay? And don't be misled with the doctors. They don't have enough, uh, I would say, experience or enough insights because for SDHB, they may say, okay, it's very small tumor, uh, let's say two centimeter, 1.5 centimeter. We will offer you, you know, the partial adrenalectomy. Don't ever accept that, okay? Because the SDHB, since it's on aggressive sites, problematic sites, you have to remove it with the all, with the entire adrenal gland. This is actually the practice today, okay? So SDHB has to be taken a little bit different way. And for example, for the adrenal gland, and I understand the patient will lose one adrenal gland, but we still have, you know, the second one, and hopefully there won't be, you know, tumor on the contralateral side. Uh, so that's about the SDHB, and we yes. can talk about it later on, you know, okay. based on the, some, some additional questions. When we sure. talk about, you know, the miscarriage, catecholamines, it depends, you know. So I would like to know whether the patient has or had pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, because the catecholamines, you know, during the pregnancy, you know, can be related to some other, actually, um, I would say, situation. And it depends how much they were elevated, you know. Mm -hmm. So usually I can tell you if the patient does not have a pheochromocytoma and has elevated catecholamines, let's say slightly elevated or moderately, should not be related to me. me uh, they should not cause some miscarriage because, you know, the, that needs to have, you know, higher elevation of catecholamines and rather the spells. 
Spells means that if you have a pheochromocytoma during pregnancy, just the tumors start working for unclear reasons, you know, unpredictable, and release a huge amount of catecholamines. That's the problem with the miscarriage because, of course, catecholamines can cause vasoconstriction, ischemia, and fetal, fetal ischemia and everything that that could actually lead though, to those consequences. So here I cannot really answer very well unless I would have actually more information. But if sure. you did not have pheochromocytoma during the, or paracanglima during the pregnancy, I a little bit doubt that catecholamines were the cause. Yeah, and 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 they say that uh, they were only slightly elevated. Yeah, it's slightly elevated. I don't think that that was the cause. There was something, something, uh, something else. Because slightly elevated catecholamines would not do it. Got it. Thanks, and thanks, Kate, for your question. Uh, sorry to hear of your loss. Sending you love. Uh, next question from Peggy: Could pheochromocytoma cause an eye stroke, also known as a retinal artery occlusion? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, because you know that, of course, you know, the catecholamines are released into circulation mm -hmm. and they go everywhere. They go everywhere and they, of course, you know, go into the eye and, you know, the vasculatures of the, uh, of the eye. We actually saw it, uh, I think, in one or two patients many, many years ago, and especially, you know, for example, when there was a test that was called glucagon test. It's abandoned just now, but it used to be the test to prove if somebody has a pheochromocytoma and just quickly, if you know, you injected glucagon, glucagon, you know, stimulated pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, release catecholamines, and based on the release of catecholamines, you, uh, you actually indicate it or you, uh, you uh, actually um, uh, could uh, distinguish between whether the patient has pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma or there is none. And uh, we had actually uh, patients who had the glucagon test, whether it was at the NIH or outside the NIH, and they had, for example, temporary problem with uh, retinal vasculature and, for example, problem with the vision because that huge amount of catecholamines cause vasoconstriction. And sometimes you don't know where the vas vasoconstriction will be the most um, and uh, can cause actually organ damage. And eye is organ, like, you know, for example, intestine, it can be intestinal ischemia, can be for kidney ischemia. We know about your bubble ischemia. Bubble ischemia is very common in patients with high catecholamine levels because the catecholamines jump on the vessels that are feeding actually the bubble and can cause, you know, ischemia. So yes, it, uh, it definitely can cause. Got it. Thanks, Peggy. Hopefully that helped. Next question from Erica. Erica says, I am SDHC. I recently mm -hmm. had a dopamine secreting vagal paraganglionoma removed and two of my three daughters inherited the SDHC mutation from me. So my question is, how likely are they uh, to get tumors? Yeah, so SDHC is not very common. The, the good thing here for you is that SDHD usually behave uh, be in better way. They are not so commonly metastatic. Of course, they can uh, become metastatic, but not like, for example, for SDHB, D, or uh, A. C is practically presenting better. Yes, you presented with uh, head and neck paraganglioma or paragangliomas and they were removed. It's interesting they were secreting. I would like to know what do you mean by secreting because those tumors secrete uh, only dopamine or norepinephrine and very, very seldom in one to 5%. So, so it would be very interesting to find out. However, the question was, you know, what about your children? And they are positive. Uh, we don't, we don't know exactly about SDHC because the number of patients presenting with SDHC is very, very limited, okay, compared to B or compared to, for example, D. But I would guess that that would be somewhere about the 15 to 20 percent. Okay, it. so they will definitely need a lifelong uh, follow-up. 
Okay. And uh, just for information, for the person who asked, you know, there are the new guidelines right now. They were published. Uh, if you put my name in the PubNet, so-called PubNet, and uh, put, you know, my name and it's uh, Nature Review Endocrinology, new guidelines, including SDHC, were just, you know, the published few months. I think it was approximately a few months ago. And you will find out how actually to follow uh, or how to do follow up for your children. And I think that this is pretty reasonable and I would stick with those uh, uh, guidelines and recommendation. It's really fairly done and is based on the uh, international group of experts uh, uh, worldwide. Got it, got it, thank you. Folks, we're about halfway done with today's episode of Lunch with the Experts. We are here with Dr. Carol Patsak, and we were talking about pheochromocytoma and paraganglionoma. Great questions today so far. Keep it up. Next question from Donna. Donna says, I had surgery in 1980 for a pheo. I was told that I can lead a normal life and no follow-up required. But in October of 2020, my endocrinologist found a paraganglionoma and removed it laparoscopically. Uh, scopically. Since the surgery, I feel the symptoms recurring. So at this point, how should I proceed? Yeah, so it's interesting. So most likely when you had 42 years uh, ago, you know, your surgery, you were very young. So the, and you again develop paraganglioma. First of all, I would do genetic testing. Most likely, most likely by, I would say 80, 90%, you have the uh, genetic problem, and you should find out, especially if you have uh, some children or brothers, sisters, uh, who should le- actually learn about these genetic testing results in case that you would like to share them if uh, there would be positive. So it's number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, after removal of the paraganglioma, it could be removed partially, which means that there is something left behind, and it would be very good to have approximately I would say six to eight weeks after surgery when you recover fully and when you don't have, a, for example, pain and you are doing otherwise very well to have the measurement of plasma metanephrines. Some, some um, I would say, medical centers will say, oh, you can have a urine metanephrines, yes, and catecholamines, yes, you can have it. But I would suggest that plasma metanephrines and catecholamines or only plasma metanephrines. It's enough if you will have only plasma metanephrines and only urine metanephrines, but the plasma will be slightly better, slightly better, okay? And because you already had the second one and you were operated, I would be very careful and I would like to get as much as possible. However, when they will do it, you have to find the office or somebody who will try to put you in a supine position. So they will put the head lock, you know, they will put you in a supine position, resting, you know, in one room for approximately 15 minutes. The minimum is 15 minutes. And then they will do the blood, uh, uh, blood draw. And I think that that would be actually, that would be, uh, that would be the best. Uh, and, uh, then based on the results that you will see if they are elevated, there is high suspicion for uh, either that something is behind or you can even have another tumor somewhere else and then you will need uh, some type of specific imaging uh, uh, studies. And I think that that would be good if you contact us uh, here you know, at the NIH. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, you, uh, you may have, you know, my email or, you know, it can be announced at the end of this. Uh, yeah, we'll make uh, sure to put it in the comment uh, section. Yeah, of this session. And uh, that's that would be that would be fine. And we will be happy, actually, to guide you and to help you. And even if you are somewhere close to NIH, as, as I said before, we are located in Maryland, close to Naval Hospital uh, here in Bethesda. We will be happy to look at that or at least to review your records because it's something very interesting since you had already tumor in 1980. Got it. Thank you so much mm-hmm. for your question. Uh, moving on, we got a lot of great dense questions today. I'm excited about this and we have the right guest for it. Erica says, is there any correlation between women's periods and other hormonal fluctuation such as pregnancy with tumor growth, catecholamine release, et cetera. So would would getting ovaries removed, for example, 
or a full hysterectomy be beneficial for women with active SDHC disease? Oh, this is a tough question. I told tough you, Dr. Question. Bessai. You are I giving me you. tough question. <laughs> okay, so I will go a little bit, you know, to periods and also the pregnancy. Yeah. Always remember that there are studies that started in the 70s and they were experimental studies. They found on experimental animals, if you increase the estrogen levels, mm -hmm. you know, they promote the growth and actually appearance of your chromocytoma, okay? I am believer of that estrogens, high estrogen, especially during the pregnancy, they may actually, in some, I could not say, I cannot say in all, but in some patients, they can promote tumor growth. So if you already have a tumor and you become pregnant, okay, so you have to be aware that these tumors may, and I said may, not in all of them, may be bigger at the end of the pregnancy because high estrogen levels. So therefore they have to be very carefully, those women, they have to be very carefully checked and they have to be aware of that because the estrogen levels are very high, okay? In the, to be uh, related to periods, I don't think that that would be, you know, there would be any changes in terms of uh, uh, tumor or tumor growth because we, we had many, many patients with, uh, you know, uh, the periods were, you know, sometimes, you know, heavy, sometimes, you know, infrequent or the, uh, on the other side, very frequent or, um, uh, or even more frequent than it sh should be. And we did not see any correlation. I have to be honest that we did not study everything, you know, in details, but after more than 20 years, seeing you know, so many patients, I would get maybe some feeling that there is maybe some relationship and I don't think so. So I would not actually advise the hysterectomy or anything like that in patient who has, for example, pheochromocytoma or paragangliema. I think that that would be absolutely okay, except for what I said during the pregnancy, because that, that, can, be, that can be a little bit different. Got it. Thanks, Erica. Hopefully that helped. Moving along, um, Karen says, is it common for head and neck paraganglionomas to secrete? Yeah, so it's approximately up to 5%. Up to 5%, they can secrete catecholamines. They will secrete only and only norepinephrine or dopamine. Norepinephrine in about approximately 1% to 3% maximum. Dopamine, maybe it will be higher, maybe 5 to 7% but they can secrete the metabolite and the metabolite of dopamine is methoxytyramine. But remember something, uh, and for our, uh, for our audience, for our patients, if you have a high dopamine or higher dopamine or methoxytyramine, it will not do anything with your body whatsoever, okay? Don't worry about that, okay? Nothing, nothing to be done, no any specific blockade, nothing with the elevated dopamine methoxytyramine because they are like inert. They don't, have a, they don't exert any action on the organs. You will need to have extremely high dopamine levels to maybe to see some hypotension, but those extreme le levels I saw only once in a 20 years history and that patient had severe metastatic disease. So, so I would say no problem. With the norepinephrine, yes, because of course, it's norepinephrine, whether it's from head and neck paraganglioma, or whether it's, for example, from paraganglioma in the chest and the abdomen will be elevated. If it is elevated, will actually affect some organs and you have to have the blockade before, for example, the patient is operated. But even if the patient is not operated, you know, it's causing high blood pressure or tachycardia and the patient needs, you know, some blockade on daily basis. Got it. Thanks, Karen. Next question from Carla. Carla mm -hmm. says, what would you think of a 13-year-old child, a possible subcentimeter left adrenal nodule in MIBG, clear abdominal MRI, and a clear gallium 68? Uh, symptomatic, unable to attend school due to symptoms, and her electrophysiologist, cardiologist, has told us to 
to go back to a different endo endocrinologist to make sure the tumor wasn't missed. So she has a portal uh, in the NIH and we haven't heard back yet. If not the NIH, which doctor should we have uh, assess her situation? So the first, how big is the tumor? Um, possible, a possible substance centimeter left adrenal nodule. Yeah, so left adrenal nodule. So, and uh, first of all, um, uh, if I understood well, it's positive on MIBG and positive on the tate. Is that correct? You know, so because there was a positivity of the MI, uh, the, uh, on the MIBG, positivity on the tate, and she cannot function well because of, you know, so this mm -hmm. tumor is most likely secreting catecholamines and the catecholamines affecting her body, especially blood pressure, heart rate, and maybe, you know, some, uh, some other organs. So sub-centimeter tumor can be removed, as I told you, seven millimeter and up, you know, so if I would have this patient, I'm not sure if I have this patient, you know, because you mentioned something about the NIH, but uh, this, uh, this patient should have, actually should be considered if those tests are positive and if CT scan or MRI actually delineates the tumor and has some, maybe some specific characteristics and is secretory, I would definitely approach uh, 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 your daughter, uh, uh, with the with the operation. Got it. Okay. So there is no reason, you know, to wait, and there is no reason, you know, to do something something else. You know, if the specific imaging studies, especially MIBG dotted, it shows the tumor. I can tell you honestly, it's pheochromocytoma, even small pheochromocytoma. Then it depends on surgeons what they will tell you whether it's feasible or not. But as I said, seven millimeter and up, it can be feasible. Okay. Okay. okay thanks, Carla. Hopefully that helped. And uh, and this goes for Carla and anybody else. If if there are follow up questions that you have that come from that question, feel free to chime back in later. Make sure you give me some context so that we know who what uh, question you're referring we referring to earlier. So just give me a little bit of you know, uh, of context there instead of just blurting out like it was this. Uh, so that way I'll, I'll remember, remember your question from earlier. All right, moving forward. Or you can, you can contact me. You can contact you me. Go. I will be happy, you know, to comment further, especially if the case, if the situation or some, you know, okay. some, some situation difficulties cases, you know, are, you know, problematic. I think mm -hmm. that sometimes it needs a little bit more information and discussion. Okay. And folks, we always put our guest information in the comments section, so you, you can find that there for easy access to Dr. Patsak. Next question from Ranjit. Ranjit says, if adrenal medullary hyperplasia can be a precursor to pheochromocytoma, mm -hmm. or can it be, rather, and cause the same issues as a pheo, why is surgery not considered an appropriate treatment? Yeah, so a very interesting, challenging question. I will tell you why. Because adrenomedullary hyperplasia may or may not uh, go to development of pheochromocytoma. If you have, a, for example, a red oncogene mutation, most likely it will happen. If you have a SDHB, we talk about it, most likely it will happen. But it may not happen. And the problem is that uh, because it's not typical tumor, it's hyperplasia, so, and even there is a study and the first study came from Germany from Dr. Drale, uh, maybe about 15, 20 years ago and operating on the patient with adrenomedullary hyperplasia and then the patient were doing, uh, doing much better. But, you know, here in this environment, at least in the US, you know, I cannot talk about, you know, some other countries, mm -hmm. but at least in the US, the, the, you will not get operation because if something happens during operation, whether it's infection, hemorrhage, or something even worse, you know, that can, that can happen, you know, the doctors uh, and healthcare professionals could be easily sued, okay? Because, you know, that would, would be, uh, that would be discussion. Look here, there was no typical tumor. Why did, why you did operate it, you know, on the adrenal gland mm -hmm. and, uh, not waiting for typical tumor that would be uh, detected by CT and uh, MRI. So I tell you honestly, 
if you are located in US, you will most likely not find any doctor who will say, I will operate, you know, here, un unless I will see and can delineate, you know, some tumor, you know, that is coming from this adrenomedullary hyperplasia. This is how it is, you know, these days, you know, these days are, everything is a little bit complicated, difficult, you know what I mean. And, uh, and uh, that can go into complicated, uh, difficult scenario if something happens. And plus, there are, is no good data, uh, I would say, with the long follow up, whether those patients who were operated for adrenomedullary hyperplasia, and most likely you would lose the whole adrenal gland. You have to lose the entire adrenal gland with adrenomedullary hyperplasia. You cannot actually have a partial adrenalic tummy. It would not work so well, okay? So whether the, this is beneficial or not, okay? So unfortunately, this is uh, the practice uh, today, at least in the US, but you know, outside US, it can be different and I cannot comment about that. Understood. Okay, next question, folks, we've got about 15 minutes left. So again, great questions today. We're going to keep on asking them. Uh, Erica says, what is the best routine follow up for para patients in terms of imaging, blood work, etc? So how often, what types of scans, gallium, dotatate, PET scan, etc? Uh, serum catecholamines, and is there any preparation for that blood work? Timing, fasting, laying down? Yeah, so, so it's very broad, actually, right. question. I would spend a lot of time, but I, can, I will be very, very short. Yes, okay. there are some instructions, recommendations. Uh, maybe you can look at the um, recommendation from uh, US Endocrine Society. They were published in Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism in 2014. You will okay. find everything there. But what is important is always... Uh, always ask about the plasma or urine metanephrines. Metanephrines, ask, you know, if you had pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma to have it every year, okay? Mm -hmm. Every approximately two or three years, depending what kind of pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma you had. If you have SDHB, B as a bad, you know, you will have it more often, but usually every two, three years to have imaging study of the whole body, okay? The whole body, it can be done with MRI and can be uh, alternate uh, with the CT scan. Once can be MRI, let's say in a two, three years, once, you know, with the, with the CT scan. It depends on your physician, it depends on your insurance, etc. That is the basic that what you have to do. And remember every year, every year you have to do, you know, the plasma or urine metanephrines. If something is abnormal, you need imaging immediately, and then, you know, to go from there. The imaging means CT and MRI, and if there is something suspicious, you always have to have functional imaging study, and it is either the dotatate scan, so-called gallium dotatate scan, mm -hmm. or, you know, the uh, fluorodeoxyglucose, so-called FDG uh, scan. Both are called positron emission tomography or PET scans. Got it. Got it. Thank you very much. Moving right along. Erica says I'm SDHC had a left sided, uh, left sided vagal paraganglionoma removed recently. There's possibly a residual or recurrent disease plus speculation of a CBT on the same side. I've been mm -hmm. having abdominal pain, bloating, discomfort, nausea, et cetera. And a recent abdominal ultrasound revealed a liver hemangioma. Uh, should I be considered, uh, or should, should I be considered it is related to my SDCH variant? Yeah. So, so most likely the bloating, uh, and liver hemangioma and, you know, the abdominal, uh, or GI problems are most likely not related to SDHC. Okay. Right. So that's number one. Number two is that, uh, since you had, uh, vagal paraganglioma removed, oh, that's not easy. I can tell you honestly that I'm pretty sure you went to some very specialized center. There are only very few and even outcomes can be questionable. But uh, uh, if you have a residual, you have to have a regular follow-up, you know, with the MRI. Uh, 
uh, that uh, that area and as well as remember as well as dotatate scan you need a dotatate scan together with the mri and if there is you know some change in terms of growth you will need to uh, most likely the external beam radiation and uh, not always can be done but i think that it could be done and it's very very good because 80 90 percent of patients having external beam radiation rather than surgery for example for vagal paraganglioma they, the, they have a long term and if they have a long term follow-up the the tumor can be stabilized for a long period of time in approximately 80 90 percent of patients got it Okay, next question from Jennifer. General question here. Many people that have had very secretory uh, FIOs and went misdiagnosed for years now have different forms of dysautonomia, POTS, MCAS, Sol fiber neuro neuropathy with mm -hmm. all, uh, 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 autonomic components and all the mm -hmm. symptoms that accompany all these and more. So mm -hmm. in a sense, they have not returned to normal. Will more studies and research be forthcoming? And what is your thought about this? Thank you. Yeah, so that's that's interesting question. Yes, they have this problem. They have a usually elevated catecholamines. They don't have elevated metanephrine so much, okay? They may have a discrepancy between how much uh, catecholamines uh, versus metanephrines are elevated versus if you have a pheochromocytoma where the metanephrines goes even you know, higher than, for example, catecholamines because the metanephrines are metabolized of catecholamines inside the tumor tissue. So unfortunately, there is not so much research for autonomic disorders and uh, this, auto this autonomia. These patients are miserable, miserable because they have a really very severe uh, spells of uh, hypertension, tachycardia, uh, going from hypertension, tachycardia into the hypotension and a lot of a lot of problems, but there is no very good treatment at the present time. If you have something like this, I would suggest to contact uh, uh, the group at the Vanderbilt University. I don't know who is uh, just now the head of the group, but they are focusing on autonomic nervous system and disorders of autonomic nervous system. And I think that that would be good, you know, to contact the group from Vanderbilt University, okay? But there is not too much, you know, going on, you know, okay. in this area, uh, but it can be distinguished from pheochromocytoma paraganglioma very well. Got it. Anna says, I am loving all the questions and answers. I couldn't agree more, Anna. And with about seven minutes left, we're going to hopefully get maybe two or three more. Patricia says, I have been told by several doctors in the past that a new tumor in my vagal or carotid or jugular area is inoperable due to the vagal nerve paralysis on the other side from a vagal paraganglionoma removed 20 years ago, i.e. the risk of permanent tracheotomy slash need for the feeding tube. Is that still the guidance for bilateral tumors? You mean bilateral tumors are the bilateral tumors carotid body tumors, or you have bilateral tumors to the, as a vagal, you know, paraganglioma? But uh, if you have already deficit, you know, so it will be very difficult to operate on you because mm -hmm. everybody will be scared that if you get on the other side, for example, you have a tumor on the other side, let's say you have the paresis or problem on the left side and so you have something on the right side and to operate on you on the right side is very risky, very risky. It depends on the size of the tumor. And uh, if it is, for example, carotid body tumor that is one or two centimeter, that would be maybe fine. But over two centimeter, or if you have a vagal, paraganglioma or for example jugular paraganglioma definitely that that can be disaster complete disaster okay so what you will need to have you know external beam radiation and if you think that uh, you don't want to have external beam radiation have the dotatate scan they will be positive i assure you they will be positive and ask your physician to give you octreotide injection of octreotide every month because they will stabilize these tumors and if you stabilize all these tumors, you know, you can stabilize them for a long period of time. And this is the victory, yeah? 
You okay. don't want, you know, these tumors to be bigger. You already have them. So if they would be there as the same tumors, which means they will be stabilized in terms of growth, I think that this is the winning situation. But don't touch it with the surgery if you already have some deficit and maybe severe deficit because you really can end up with a very complicated, uh, uh, very complicated situation. Got it. Thanks, Patricia. Um, and I see someone else. I see Elizabeth also was interested in that question. We still have a few minutes. So if we didn't get to everything um, in your question that you that you needed to know, uh, feel free to go ahead and chime back in and we'll try to we'll try to uh, uh, field any follow up questions. Next question from Katrina. What advice does Dr. Patsak advise or have for genetic counseling or intervention? For someone with the SDHB mutation, but no current cancer, and, and they're young, uh, and also for someone who is young and has metastatic PGL with SDHB, but living with stable tumors. Yeah, so SDHB, you know, without tumor, you know, that is the definitely good to have genetic counseling. I told you before, we published just now the paper, Nature Review Endocrinology, if you put my name, and uh, there are many others, you know, so you will find it and go based on, you know, what is there. It's simple. It's, uh, it's really easy to read and you will see, you know, what to do. But I already said every year biochemistry, every two, three years doing, mm -hmm. you know, imaging studies. If somebody has a metastatic disease related to SDHB, it, re it depends whether if it is stable well, it depends, but this person needs at least, you know, every six months imaging study. That can be very expensive, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other side, there are some studies, NIH is opening very interesting study right now, and it's, it's related to SDHB. It's free of charge, completely free of charge. And uh, it's affecting, you know, some molecules that is very crucial in SDHB. And we hope that there will be very good results. So if you are interested, you know, send me email, you know, we can discuss together and I can talk with my colleague from NCI, NCI is National Cancer Institute and we can mm -hmm. help. Got it. Okay, um, thanks for that question. Next question from Arlene, can red spots about one centimeter or smaller, can they on the skin of the back, can they be caused from pheochromocytoma? I get multiple spots on my back that increase in intensity and then almost disappear for no reason. And I had a pheo on the right adrenal gland removed in 2010. Everything was good for a few years, and then meta metanephrines started to increase. And we removed the T9 vertebrae due to a tumor in 2019, and now they have found more tumors throughout. These spots on my back have recently increased in number. So could yeah. that be? So, so if it is related skin lesion, very, very, it's related to pheo as slash paraganglioma. Yes, sometimes you know it's possible. However, it's extremely, extremely rare. And if this is the case, this is the situation. It's usually metastatic lesion. And how do you find out about that? So number two, two, uh, two important uh, um, uh, aspects. One is that if you look at that lesion and you palpate the lesion, you know, it should have some catecholamine, so your blood pressure heart rate should go up, okay? Mm -hmm. So usually, not always, but usually. And the second, if the lesion is disappearing sometimes and another lesion is coming, or this lesion is, you know, just disappearing, coming back, it will definitely not be pheochromocytoma slash paraganglima in terms of metastatic disease, because if you have a tumor, it will not disappear, okay? So, and of course, you know, you can do the biopsy. If you are really afraid what's going on, uh, you know, the biopsy can be done and they can find out what is going on, okay? But it's very rare, very rare, you know? So I, I, I a little bit doubt that that would be pheoparaganglioma, but, you know, I would need to see you. Okay, got it. Uh, I think we have time for one more. Sheila says, what is your opinion on a Zedra and Lutathera radioactive therapies to treat paras and pheo? Oh, oh so, so Azedra and Lutathera both are very good, you know, stabilization okay. of the disease or partial response in 90%. They are comparable. Remember, remember one thing. If you use the, uh, the Lutathera, you know, so this is usually for the patients that who... Um, uh, who are a little bit older, who may have a little bit bone marrow, 
to suppress, slightly suppress, because, you know, the load of radioactivity, you know, it's not very high. It's 200 millicurie four times, okay? If you have a azedra, it's, I would say it's rather for those that they are in very good shape, very good bone marrow reserve. They don't have, for example, anemia, lower, you know, platelets, you know, the lower granulocytes. They have a very good blood count. They are younger because they have a very good bone marrow reserve because when you give them azetra, you give them 500 millicure one dose. Can you imagine 500 millicuries? And 3% they develop acute leukemia. 4% develop, you know, myelodysplastic syndrome. So you have already 7% of patients, if you take them, they will have actually life-threatening consequences, okay? So you have to be aware of that. So Lutatera and Zazidra, both are very good, excellent, but you have to be very careful. If you would like to read about that something, we just published article in Clinical Cancer Research. If you put Lutatera and Azedra, and my name is already with many other authors. You will find it. And I think that this is pretty interesting article that you will find the response because I, we are limited with time. So I cannot give you more details right now. But remember that, okay? Azedra is good, but it's very heavy. Got it. Folks, that's going to be it today. I want to finish on this statement from Fred. Thanks for this program. My oncologist is always amazed at the knowledge I have on carcinoid cancer and neuroendocrine tumors. And the questions I asked during my visits, all of which are capable as a result of the information given by you, Rain, and the experts on the program. Fred, that totally encapsulates the whole purpose of us, us doing this show and the reasoning and the purpose behind it. I'm so glad that it is helping you, and I hope that it is helping others in the same way. Dr. Patsak, thank you for being with us today to, to help some of these net patients. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you so much. It was my great pleasure, you know, to participate in this session. And as I said before, if there is somebody who would like to talk to me, to contact me, feel free. I will be more than happy, you know, to communicate with you. And I can promise one thing that I will respond. <laughs> I love it. Because I always respond. That's a and guarantee, I will be happy folks. to help you because this is why we are here. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's very kind of your Dr. Potsock. Thanks again. And thanks to you all at home, as always, for joining us. We hope this program helped answer some of your questions. And please reach out to CCF at carcinoid.org for further information if you have any other questions. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. Without them, this program wouldn't be possible. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I am your host. Thank you for watching. And please join us next time for Lunch with the Experts. Stay healthy. Stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye.